Okay, then we then we continue. Um, <coughs> the the point of departure here is that there is a scarcity of land in the central <coughs> business district, close to M here, and uh, neither Fontinen nor the other guys questioned why is it so that there is a preference for people to live on a rather concentrated in a rather concentrated area and uh, <coughs> I will not go much into that uh, during this lecture but we'll come back to that later on what can explain the the concentration of economic activity in space why why is there a preference for for, uh, let's say, being located in urban areas. Because once you can explain why, why is it so that people want to live in cities, then the rest is kind of working here because then we have the scarcity of land, incentives to, to economize with land in, in central areas, <coughs> but still be, uh, be uh, uh, located in, in central areas, depending on the nature of your business. Or if you are uh, consuming quite a lot of land, but with uh, not that much of uh, return per unit sold <coughs> from your business, then you will prefer to, to be away from the city center, but still have access to, to the market. Because that's the whole point here, that the market is assumed to be located in the, in the center. And uh, this is shown just for one M, or one market. But of course we know that there is, uh, in, uh, in many areas, towns are uh, smaller towns, are, uh, are scattered around, and you have nothing in between. So this this is not only a question of having one center in an area, there can be many centers that, that can uh, have the same type of, of distribution of economic activity around itself. Come back to this also a bit later. On. But the substitution effects here <coughs> is, uh, can, be, can be illustrated like this. So this is... Uh, production in terms of units and along these curved lines you have the same amount of production and then you can uh, substitute land for other production factors along this this uh, indifference curve or ISO production curve if you like and then we can, uh, <coughs> can consider an increase in land prices. That means to, let's say, facilitate the, the way to think about this. This can be a decision that can be made as a, uh, or you can be at the decision making point where you are going to choose between being located centrally or more distant from the center. And uh, <coughs> this is uh, a situation where, where you have um, the production cost constraint given along this axis. You can spend all your, um, all your, all your production costs on land, or, or conversely, all production costs on, on all other factors. And you have an optimal situation where, where the, this cost curve is, uh, or this, let's say, budget is uh, tangential to the highest possible ISO production curve. So at this point, you have the distribution between using land or using other production factors. Uh, and now you can say, well, 
let's consider uh, moving to, to an area closer to the city center. That means that the uh, unit cost per square meter of land is increasing. So, and the, and the cost of all the other production factors is, remains constant. So this budget, production budget line swings inwards like this because you have no change here. All the changes are connected to the land use costs. And the new adaptation point will be here. And the, uh, and the, the point is that by doing that, you consume less land, but you increase the consumption of other production factors. So you substitute away a bit of land for, for other factors. And you will have the same situation if you, if you now assume that uh, for some reason this production budget can be increased so that you are still producing 200 units. By doing that you parallel this line until you, uh, you become tangential with this 200 curve again should be at that point, which will give you an even bigger substitution effect in terms of a more pronounced increase in the use of all other production factors. But you, you will then consume a bit, a bit more of land. It works like this. You have the increase, this is L1, L2, and this is O1, O2. And <coughs> this is land, and this is other. And if you now say that, well, we, we, st we, can, we can still produce 200 units, then this, this curve is paralleled like this. And we get a point here, which we can call L3, and an even more consumption of other production factors. So, <coughs> so there is something going on here, which, uh, and the shape of these indifferent curves will, of course, affect to what extent you get this substitution effect to take place. Uh, if you, if they are shaped in slightly different ways, that will affect the the way the changes are, are, uh, are expressed along these, these axes. But in principle, um, you try as a consumer or as a producer to, to adapt yourself to the best possible outcome, which will be here if, you, if the production budget is remained uh, constant and it will be here if the production budget is compensated for the price change of, of land. But even if you get the same, uh, let's say, to be able to still produce 200, you will substitute away some of the land for other production factors if the price of land increases. And uh, <coughs> if you you can expand this illustration to show or to construct a demand curve for land units by keeping land 
still at the horizontal axis, but you have instead of instead of other units on the vertical axis, you have price of land. Here. And um, <coughs> we have the initial situation where the price of land, or, or where the quantity of land is, is here at L1, still L1. And we know that in this, in this point, the price of land is given. It's, it's known to you that the price here could be expressed as P1. which could be 5,000 Norwegian kroner per, per uh, hectare or whatever. And when you increase the price of land, and you can translate that to an everyday number that you can derive from, uh, from uh, real estate brokers, the square meter price of flats or of, uh, uh, let's say, shop floors. So we know that when you move to the to, uh, closer to the city center, you can ha easily obtain information about the price. So here we have this change. is determined from what we know about the real estate prices. Here we know that when we have increased the price, we get this demand for land. And we know the price. And we have the demand curve for land. <laughs> Is it better? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <coughs> and the slope of this demand curve is uh, determined by the price uh, elasticity. Of, of land in this case. So we see that uh, it's it's quite it's quite uh, intuitively reasonable that uh, when the price of one good increases, you would look for other possibilities to maximize let's say, the return, let's say, of, of, of land, you can, uh, you can uh, engage into activities that gives a high return per square meters by, uh, by let's say, employing more machinery or uh, whatever is needed to produce the goods. So this is the substitution effect that we talk about in the in the bid rent curves. When we talk about the bid rent curves. So <coughs> for an individual firm, again a company, uh, the, the profitability of the firm is higher when you move out out here from the from the origin. So, uh, what I, as I said, along one of these curves, for a given company, the profit is uh, is competed away. It is zero. Again, we we assume here a competitive economy where where uh, where you don't have any monopoly profits. 
So this BR3 is a company that uh, that doesn't do as well as BR1, the BR1 company. So these are bid rent curves for three different companies. And they may have different slopes. This, this is uh, kind of a, a comp uh, three companies that are engaged in the same type of business or uh, it could be, uh, it's easier to think about this three similar or it's three companies that is engaged in a similar, similar type of production but they, uh, they have uh, different, uh, let's say, BR1 is more efficient than BR3. So if they compete for, for land, BR1 will be the winner here. They are able to pay the highest land rent. And uh, if, we, if we compare then the, the fixed and flexible production technology this is a flexible production technology where you can have sub substitution between land and other production factors. Whereas the straight line is the fixed. It's only the transport costs that are, are determining uh, the land rent after the fixed costs are paid. The, the straight line is uh, kind of losing as compared to the to the company which may have a more flexible production technology that can use the available technology options by by uh, by being flexible but let's turn to something that can illustrate uh some some interesting points. This is an urban area with M as the center. Again, we assume that people the market is there, so it's not different from the Fontin uh, way of thinking in that respect. But here we see that we have three different bid rent curves, and we have one horizontal line which is actually the land rent for agriculture. So this is a city where you have agricultural areas, fields around it. So the land rent for residential activities is kind of the reservation price. So the city will not stretch itself, as itself beyond this point set here. And uh, here we have three different companies with different possibilities to substitute and they have different transport costs. So this is a contrast to this situation where you have more or less the same production um, structure but, uh, but different efficiency. Here you have different slopes because of uh, transport costs and, uh, and substitution possibilities. And you get the same logic with respect to functional split as we had when we looked upon the Fontin curves. In this case we have the service sector very close to the, to the city center. You have manufacturing here, and outside of Y, we have retail. So this is uh, a situation which uh, you can say that service is, uh, let's say, shops, lawyers, consultancies, and so on, and you have manufacturing right outside of the city center and then we have the, the retail sector let's say places where you can buy uh, construction material uh, 
for, for houses and so on. And this pattern is uh, something that was quite common, let's say some 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, where the manufacturing sector was quite close to the city center. Transport costs were perhaps high, and one very practical uh, matter, which was a determinant for this, let's say 50 plus years ago, was car ownership. So people used their uh, bicycles or uh, walked to, to work instead of being able to drive for, let's say, 20 to 40 kilometers perhaps to go to, 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 go to work. Here is a different pattern where the service sector is still in the very central areas but with a very steep uh, land rent or bid rent curve. So it's, uh, it's obviously a flexible sector which can uh, can use land very efficiently and perhaps with they have a very high return per uh, or they have a very high return per uh, per square meter so uh, the service sector could be then even within the service sector there are different segments where uh, parts of the service sector is extremely profitable and able to pay a very high land rent. And the most extreme, or one of the most extreme examples is uh, Manhattan, New York, with the skyscrapers, where the <coughs> land, land use cost per square meter is extremely high. And guess, guess who is located there? It's the real estate brokers and the consultancies and the lawyer firms and everything. Banks, financial institutions. And then you have a retail sector <laughs> right outside, which may be not the big retail and, uh, and land consuming retailers, but, uh, but more, more in the direction of, uh, of ordinary shops. Manufacturing sector has been forced out from the city center, and then you have the distribution centers al uh, along the arterial ring roads outside of the city center. And the functional split is given given here. <coughs> and for simplicity, then we have ignored uh, the agriculture agriculture sector. So this is, uh, and this looks different, depending on uh, on uh, on the composition of the economic uh, activity sectors and so on. But the pattern is fairly similar around, not around the globe, but in 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 many, let's say, developed market economies, where you have this structure. When it comes, and this is a production sector. Not, I'm not included housing here. I'll come to that later on. But uh, high return, less land demanding activities is located central, and this may uh, explain why manufacturing companies are forced out of uh, away from the central business district. They are consuming way too much land as compared to their uh, to, to competing sectors. So uh, when I <coughs> when I uh, grew up there was a big shipyard located in the central business district of Oslo. 
and that shipyard went was was uh, I, I, it simply went broke and it was not replaced by another shipyard but it was replaced by uh, by uh, upmarket uh, residence flats because the willingness to pay per square meter was much higher in that area and uh, it's a combination of uh, upmarket flats uh, offices and uh, and and restaurants So this is what I was touching upon earlier. That there is a this is a let's say a county with one bigger city and four or three smaller ones, where you can also have a a, a functional split between uh, a bigger center and uh, and sub centers like this. And this is the the rent curve. And where you have a, a concentration out here, it's the tendency that uh, housing prices increases. And then they level off again when they move, move away from the, from the center. Then for an, for an individual, we have uh, the same logic. Um, people pay as much <laughs> as they are able to and left with very little little profit and uh, the the BR1 curve is then the the curve with the highest willingness to to pay for land and again it's a uh, it's a homogeneous bunch of three individuals here and uh, it can be then expanded into a chart like this, where you have different bid rent curves depending on on demographics. Income is one way of segmenting the population, and uh, this is uh, the way it looked like in the post World War II situation. And do you have any idea why we had this structure with a low income group in the city center, a middle income group in between, and then the high income group at the outset, at the outskirts, away from the city center? They had. Um, the reason is that uh, the low income group had no um, access to cars. Transport system was in a quite uh, bad state of affairs. Some public transport was around, but not much. Uh, if you remember back to the manufacturing, uh, to the to to the curve for the for the company for the companies. The manufacturing industry was located also quite close to the city center. The flats were extremely small. Uh, my the sister of my father's father, my gran grandfather. <laughs> the sister of my grandfather. She used to live in the very center of Oslo and they and she was married and they have not had no kids so they had a very spacious uh, flat of uh, 20 square meters and she lived there all her life and in the 1980s this picture changed so the owner of the house in which she lived up on the third floor they decided to refurbish this to merge some of the flats together and make it a very upmarket place to live 
and they were successful apart from this old lady on the third floor because she refused to move and she had a lifelong contract with the property owner. So in that house, when I visited her uh, the last time she, she was there, before she, she died, there were fancy corridors, new windows, doors and everything. But up on the third floor, on top, was an old green door, still there. And, uh, but, but the story was that the families at the time, they had a lot of kids, perhaps five or six kids, and they still lived on 20 to 30 square meters. So it was extreme conditions at the time. Depending on the lack of transport systems and, uh, and this interplay between the location of the firms, manufacturing firms, and the residential areas. Whereas the high income groups, they had cars, they can drive to and from, and they can and they could replace, substitute uh, land for for other easily. They could substitute land for other uh, qualities because they could just drive downtown to go to work. So they could pay. They pay less per square meter, but they consume a lot more of land for their big uh, big houses and so on. And that this structure is uh, is a mirror of Oslo. After uh, after the Second World War and even before that. But uh, things are changing, and this is uh, this is a slightly different picture, where. You have the young high income group in the close to the city center. And then you have the bid rent for the low income group, which are still somewhere not too far from the city center. And these areas are typical areas where they are doing, they try to upgrade, they try to do refurbishments. So this group is perhaps on its way out of these areas. Again, it's a mirror of Oslo in the, let's say, 1990s and up to now. With some areas quite close to the center. And if you ask a real estate broker about where to try to get a good bargain on a flat, you should buy an old, outdated flat in this area because things will be developed there. I guess uh, a lot of cities has the same. There are some, let's say, lags in the structure uh, where the remains of the post-World War II structure is about to disappear. And that is what we see here. And then you have the middle income group <coughs> in the in between here, and then the hi older high income group, which live still in the outskirts and, and drive their uh, cars to, to and from. And then <coughs> this, this could be uh, a third example. Where you have the high income group, the middle income group, and the low income group uh, in the outskirts. And this has to do with preferences and ways. Uh, and, the, and the reason why these curves are looking like this. Could you imagine why, why would the high income groups live so close to the city center and the low income groups in, uh, in the outskirts? Preferences has uh, kind of shifted over the years. High income group is uh, the people who are demanding access to culture. They may have actually a negative preference for, uh, for using their car. This may, this may be not 
a mirror of the present situation, but it may become a mirror of, let's say, what we can see in the, in the future. With weak preferences for car use, strong preferences for walking distances and access to, let's say, a modern urban life. Whereas these people are able to commute to and from the center because uh, this city will have a very good uh, suburban transport system. They may not have very good access to cars because cars will be very expensive to use. But the subway can be well developed. And if you <coughs> also compare another factor here, you can compare the DT. I think it's, it's yeah, DT here. This is the size of the city as compared to this one, where the DT DH is much, it's much longer. And then uh, these are snapshots, and it's not easy to go from a structure that looks like perhaps this one which could be a, a post-World War II Norwegian city, or it could be a actually a present American city with a very dispersed structure. The DH is very, it's very distant, a lot of car use. And it's very difficult to get from that structure and down to this condensed structure. But it's quite easy to go the other way around from a condensed structure and to a very wide urban pattern. That is just to start building highways and, uh, and subsidize the petrol prices. Then we'll be there within uh, not too many decades. And actually, some cities in the developing world are very I mean some of the academics in the in in, in uh, around in, in at the universities they are very very worried about the transformation uh, from this which is uh, a pattern due to perhaps lack of transportation systems and condensed structures, like has been the situation in, uh, in uh, let's say, Chinese cities like Hong Kong. Looks like this. But because of the strong growth in, uh, in uh, highway building programs and uh, car ownership, they're about to move to situations like this, which has some severe implications when it comes to energy use. And China, for one example, is subsidizing petrol. Other countries are also subsidizing petrol, so it costs very little to, at least as compared to Norwegian prices, and also compared to, to uh, income, private disposable income in the countries. It's relatively cheaper to drive. And uh, instead of trying to keep this structure, but make it more, let's say, livable in terms of having uh, good public transport systems and so on. And with good public transport systems, energy efficient, you could expand like this without losing much in terms of, uh, of energy efficiency as well. So it's uh, possible to just do some very simple calculations uh, where we have an example. Could be something that could be uh, 
in the direction of an uh, exam question. You have two single housing residential land use, single housing, detached houses, RS, with a, with a bid or a land rent or bid rent curve. This is, these are linear, so we can call them land rent curves of uh, x is distance. And these are the land rent per square meter, or perhaps 50 square meters, or whatever unit you would like to choose in the central business district at M. And these are the diminishing part of the function with distance. And uh, we have the apartment residential cost function. And we're talking about land, ground area uh, occupation here, so that's why the price uh, in M is so much higher per, uh, per unit. And you have a stronger diminishing structure here with, with, uh, with distance. And then you can say that uh, the, the land rent for uh, agriculture is fixed at 2000. So we can start with the uh, C here. This is uh, this is uh, costs, and this is uh, distance, and we can just try to map these three functions into into this uh, this graph, and we solve most of the other questions by uh, by doing that actually because. Here we can say that uh, this is 2000, so this is the land rent for agriculture. And then we have um, the land rent for flats in the, this is M, here at uh, it's not to scale, that's why I'm doing this. So this is 160,000. And uh, where does this line touch the horizontal line? That will be in the area where x is equal to um, 160,000 divided by 30,000 and this is equal to 5.33 so here if we say that this is get this as Rm. And we can do the same exercise with the with the single housing residentials.
which will then be um, ten. So here we get, let's say, this is twenty thousand. This is the land rent curve for single houses. And uh, <coughs> we can then, from this, uh, say that the answer to question A here Is it 10? No. It's not 10. <laughs> it should be then uh, we can take uh, A, which then should be uh, yeah. It is this area, right? So we need to to hold that against the opportunity cost here, which is agriculture. So we need to to set the the residential um, or the land use uh, land rent curve for uh, for single houses which goes further from the uh, further out from the city center equal to the land rent curve for agriculture and if we do that we get a we got the value of 9 here so this is the answer to a and b is to to set R is equal to Rm. These two expressions equal to each other. And uh, this is this point. We have five kilometers as the intersection point. If we just Set 20,000 min minus 2,000 x equal to 160,000 minus 30,000 x, you get this point. And this is the point where the flats are the winners, five kilometers from the city center, and from there to nine, you have the, uh, the single housing. Okay, uh, I think we break now for 15 minutes. <laughs>